Hi there, and welcome to Sage Advice, a web series where we interview wise and wonderful people who have developed high levels of skill and expertise in their chosen fields. Here at Sage Advice, we believe that each one teaches one. Today, we have a very special guest. I'm so excited to speak with this person, the wise, multi-talented Stephen Powers. Educated in molecular biology at MIT, Stephen Powers is a social entrepreneur, chief executive, Grammy-winning music producer, Emmy-nominated TV producer, marketing expert, board director, consultant, creative leader. Powers is currently CEO of Powers Omni Media, a production, publishing, and consultancy firm serving media clients including Wisdom LA and 360 Dome Pro, a leading technology and location-based entertainment company providing immersive VR dome theaters worldwide. I can't wait to find out more about that. So let's get to it. Welcome, Stephen, to Sage Advice Series. And I'm just thrilled to have this opportunity to speak with you and learn about your pretty amazing path. So you studied molecular biology at MIT. You produced your first record at the age of 21. And you went on to have just an incredible career as a record producer and an a and And then you go on to be a leader in the field of transformational media and social entrepreneurship with your work at Agape, Bodhi Tree, Thrive Market, and now Wisdom, and so much more, which we will get to talk about. But first, just tell me a little about that journey and how do you go from science to entertainment, leadership, and social entrepreneurship? What, what started you off? Well, thank you, Rivka. First off, I, it's my joy to be here on Sage Advice and to offer anything that I may have learned on my uh, fairly lengthy journey, which will hopefully continue, uh, to those who I, I might be able to share that with. So it's truly my joy uh, to be here. So it was. Um, it is an unusual transition. It is one that people immediately kind of notice. It's like, wait a minute, molecular bi biology at MIT, record producer, how did that happen? So um, it was unfortunately a uh, tragedy. And, and what we know about, uh, about life is that you can either be pushed by pain or pulled by vision. And in this particular case, I was pushed by pain. And that pain was that my 15 year old sister uh, was killed by a drunk driver uh, in a terrible automobile accident. He was going hundred miles an hour on the wrong side of the road. Uh, and I was 18 at the time. And so that, event, which was so traumatic for me. She was really a, such a dear friend. We, we enjoyed the arts together. She was, her name was Charlotte, and she was starring in the school, high school play on the evening of her passing. Uh, she had the starring role in it because she was a great singer and dancer and actress and probably had a very promising career in, uh, in the entertainment business or in the show business ahead of her uh, when this um, gentleman took her, his life and her life. Uh, and so what that made me keenly aware of is that we do not know how much time we have on this earth. We don't know how long we may have. And so we want to really be, act on what is most important to us, that which we're most passionate about, that which is really in our heart. So it gave me an opportunity to really look at my life and say, am I a scientist? Am I an artist? Am I a businessman? Who am I? And, and in that year following her passing, I really had uh, a lot of deep introspection and moments to really think about it with the new awareness, which I don't think you have when you're young. You think you're going to live forever. You think you're invulnerable. And then, you know, something like this happens and it makes you so aware that we don't know how long we have. And so I really discovered in my own heart that I was probably more of an artist and really had that great passion and love for that. But that's what really made that big shift for me. And um, specifically, I was given $1,000, each of the, my four remaining siblings, myself and my three remaining siblings, received $1,000 from the state of Illinois because in, in compensation for the loss of our sister. Because here was a guy, this guy was this drunk driver, He'd been arrested a half a dozen times for drunk driving. And it was before the drunk driving laws were so strict. And it was before Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And it, but it was still a huge tragedy that was occurring in America. And um, so the state went, OK, we're going to compensate you for your loss. And they gave me $1,000. So in, my, in the summer 
of my uh, sophomore year between, uh, I guess it would have been 1970 to 71, I took that money and I opened a little storefront coffee house called the Orpheus Coffee House. And Orpheus, of course, was the uh, Greek god of music. And, uh, and I uh, put it in a little storefront and I ran it all summer long uh, and then closed it and went back to school in the fall. Uh, but I, unbeknownst to me, there were customers who came every weekend who were a couple who were patrons of the arts in Rockford. And they loved the Orpheus and they reached out to me and they said, we, you don't know us, but we came to your club all the time and we would like to back you to open a full on performing arts center uh, in Rockford. We'll put up the money, we'll get you the building, you bring your gifts and talents and, and open a performing arts center if, you, if that interests you. Wow. And I was like, I think so, you know, <laughs> I'd like to do that. Um, and thus, uh, I named uh, the club Charlotte's Web, and it was in her honor. And it was, for me, very much a healing journey. It was what I was able to do in response to this tragedy, in response to this loss, in order to start giving, start celebrating, and start remembering the joy that was Charlotte, rather than the tragedy of her passing. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very much for me, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. But it was also, in the process, something that I could give to the community. Because Do you think, even were you aware of that at the time or, or were you acting on sort of inspired impulse and, and you realize this now looking back? I think more the latter. I was definitely acting on inspired impulse, but I was very conscious that I wanted to do something that would honor her life. Uh, so I didn't know that much, but I didn't realize how it really was more for me than for others. But, uh, that's something I think I came to look back at. And uh, there's a great bit of wisdom that we teach best what we need to know most. So by becoming involved in this kind of work and, and you know, putting out music and creating entertainment and, and really becoming aware of my mission, that's what I needed to know. And so by doing it, I became certain that that's who I was. Wow. So, and you're in your twenties at that point and you're, yes. making, you're and, I, and I literally wrote out at that time that my mission, and you know, I later learned where, you know, where uh, personal development teachers and wisdom teachers talk about understanding your mission in life, your purpose in life. I hadn't had that training yet, but I literally wrote out that my mission was to use arts and entertainment to uplift the human spirit. Wow. So at that young age, you all had that mission statement. That sounds like it came from a very organic space. Yeah, I think that came truly from my heart, just from, you know, a download from the divine. So cool. So, so after Charlotte's Web, where do you go from there? Well, the, then the first anniversary of Charlotte's Web. So I opened Charlotte's Web May 27th, 1972. So we're coming right up on the anniversary of what is going to be uh, the 50th anniversary of Charlotte's Web because it is still the Performing Arts Center of Rockford, Illinois. It is still oh, there. So and as we cool. carried on for so many years by the, uh, by the patrons of the arts who then took over when I left. But what I did was I decided to record an album. My first love was music. I just loved music. I was a, a big fan of, of records and albums and all the artists of the time. And that's where I really realized that energizes me. That makes me happy. That's what I'm going to do. So I decided to record an album of all of the artists who performed at Charlotte's Web, who were not cover bands. They were original singer songwriters and original artists. And uh, to use that album to promote Charlotte's Web. And so um, I recorded this album uh, live at Charlotte's Web on the first anniversary. It's called Get Folked like the folk music. So get folked, uh, kind of a you know, cute poke at, <laughs> at that name, uh, live at Charlotte's Web. And um, it's also still in print 50 years later and people still talk about you know, what a, you know, an amazing album it was. Not so much because of the, the songs were great. So that's about the songwriters, right? And the atmosphere and the energy of it were something kind of special. And, it, and I managed through the live recording to capture that. Uh, and so that turned my attention to records 
right? So maybe we can have a live performing arts, but if we make records, then those will stand the test of time and those will be something that will reach more people than just the people in Rockford, Illinois. So that was my next mission is that I really didn't want to be limited to my hometown. You know, when I went to school in Boston, I never really intended to come back to my hometown. It was only because I was lured there by Karen and Bill Howard, I want to name the patrons of the arts, Karen and Bill Howard, uh, that to come back and open Charlotte's Web that I was there. It wasn't too long of being there that I was like, well, this, you know, I don't want to stay here my whole life, uh, but I'll, you know, this is, a, this is wonderful to do this. So I started making records. And the first album that I recorded, I uh, didn't know anything about the record business didn't know that there were such things as independent record labels. I just thought of Columbia and Capitol and you know, RCA and so forth. So I called a lawyer that I knew in Chicago who was in the entertainment business who I had met through Charlotte's Web. His name is Bill Trout. He had a record label called Wooden Nickel Records that was distributed by RCA. And I said, Bill, would you put out my album that I just recorded on your record label? And he said, Stephen, my deal with RCA is ending very soon. So it wouldn't be a good choice for you. He said, but you don't need me. You can start your own record label. And the light went on. And I was like, I can? What do you mean? He said, yeah, pick a name, put it out. And he said, now there's all the rest of the structure of what is a record label. It's distribution, it's marketing, it's promotion, it's artist relations. You know, you're going to have to build some structure around it. But you don't need a license. You don't need permission to have a record label. So just do it. You know, years later, we had Nike saying, just do it. That was his advice. Just do it. So I said, OK, I'll start my own record label. And the label was called Mountain Railroad Records. And it is the name is derived from a classic uh, Appalachian folk song made famous by the Carter family called Life is Like a Mountain Railroad. Mm -hmm. And it has a wonderful verse, which is full of wisdom. We're talking about sage advice here. It says, life is like a mountain railroad with an engineer that's brave. You must make each run successful from the cradle to the grave. Keep your hand upon the throttle and your eye upon the rail. Never falter, never fail. Wow. So I like, that's me. So wow. I named the record label Mountain Railroad Records. It embodied that folk ethic. It embodied that work ethic. It embodied that optimism and off we went and I started making records. So that's how I really started to move into the record business. And at, around that time when you were building your own record label, yes, you were in, still in your 20s. So you're still young, you're Jewish. So we would say that's a lot of chutzpah <laughs> and a lot, you know, you had a lot of oomph early on. Yes. Um, and you go on to- Yeah, so let me walk you a little through how, how that all grew and developed, right? Uh, uh, which is that I started by recording the artists who I knew from Charlotte's Web. So they were regionally known artists, some of whom went on to become very famous. I mean, I made the first recording of Steve Goodman's City of New Orleans on an album that I released because he was a local Chicago folk singer who played at Charlotte's Web. Now, City of New Orleans is now a, you know iconic song. And, uh, uh, but at that time, it was the very first recording of it. Um, and then, after three albums that I had made with, with various local artists, yeah. an artist who had a national touring profile and recording profile named Steve Young. And he was uh, in the, one of the early um, prototype, if you will, of outlaw country music that uh, many of the viewers may remember, Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson, Hank Williams Jr. It was that kind of, we're not gonna be Nashville formula. We're gonna be edgy, slightly rock and roll, uh, you know, rebel country, if you will, right? And that was called Outlaw Country. And Steve Young was, was uh, very well respected by all those artists and known to me as a record collector. So I had hired him to come to Charlotte's Web and he performed there. And then he saw something in me as a mentor and he said, I'd like to make an album with you. And I was, I was shocked because he'd already made an album for A&M and for RCA and you know, I felt like he probably could get another major record deal, but instead he wanted to record for Mountain Railroad Records. And so I made, I produced an album by him in 1976 that started to get national attention. They got a top pick in Billboard and reviewed in Rolling Stone and 
played on the air in Texas. And all of a sudden, my vision of what Mountain Railroad could be grew and expanded. And because of that album, which was well received, then other artists started to come to me, other artists that had bigger followings and bigger names on a national basis. And I signed Tom Paxton and Jim Queskin and Bob Gibson and all these big stars of the folk era, which is what I started as, which was a folk label. So it just grew and grew. Um, and then I moved into rock and roll and I started producing uh, other groups and other bands. Uh, and eventually in 1984, Three, I decided I had been the big fish in the small pond in meaning the Midwest record label, you know, and I was called by the press, the major label of the Midwest, right? Which, what does that mean? Not much, right? <laughs> um, and so I decided to move to either New York or LA and, uh, and really, you know, try to try my hand at the big time and see what happens. And I knew more people in New York. And so I moved in with a friend who was a wonderful singer called Rod McDonald, singer songwriter, who was one of my folk singer friends who recorded on Mountain Railroad. And I moved to his apartment on, on, uh, on McDougal Street in the village, which was, you know, very exciting for somebody who loved folk music. Uh, and I was trying to get established in New York, but pretty much nobody cared, right? It's like, yeah, you came from the Midwest, you know, and I wasn't getting anywhere. Uh, and then one day I got a call from the uh, U.S. Olympic. Uh, the Los Angeles Olympic Committee. And I had sent my resume just randomly to the Olympic Committee uh, thinking I could go be a sound man or do something at the Olympics in Los Angeles as I was looking to make that, tra that transition uh, in 1983. But nobody called me, it didn't matter. But then one day when I was in New York, I got a call and they, were, they had fired the person who was the director of entertainment and they needed somebody urgently uh, to, to fill that role. And they'd gone back to the files and flipped through the files and pulled out my letter and my information and um, said, this guy looks interesting, let's call him. And in the course of one day, I first got a call from the secretary who found my, my, my letter. Then I got a call from the director of the Olympic Villages. Then I got a call from the person who had the overall responsibility for all the logistics. And, and each one said, well, I'm gonna have somebody else call you and I get a call in another hour. And finally, on that very same day, I get one last call and the voice doesn't introduce himself, just says, I hear you're our guy. Mm. To which, of course, I responded, yes, I am your guy. What, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what is it that, I'm, that you want me to do? And he said, this is Peter Uberoff, who was the president of the LA Olympics and went on to be the baseball commissioner. Uh, mm -hmm. And he said, when can you start? And I said, oh, right away. He said, good, be here Monday. And it was Friday in New York. So I got on a plane. I just went, yes, full-bodied yes. Came to, to LA and never looked back. That was 1984. And then the Olympics was a, um, the Olympics was a, a big deal in LA at that time. It was, you know, everybody wanted to be involved. Steven Spielberg was involved, George Lucas, top musicians. And so after I had finished my work at the Olympics, I started yeah. making the rounds of record labels again, like I had been doing in New York. And this time, uh, because of my Olympic experience, it caught the eye, the eye of the president of Capitol Records who asked me to come in for an interview. And I did the interview and was hired as the director of A&R at Capitol Records. Now that then put me into the big leagues that I had been seeking for so long. Wow, I love that. I mean, I love the story of someone saying, I hear you're the one and just saying back, yes, I am. I feel like reflective in that there's all this, what would you call it? Blind faith? First off, I, I have the gift of a lot of self-confidence thanks to my parents. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I believe I can do anything. You know, when I became a record producer, I had no experience as a record producer. I just called myself a record producer and it was my project. So I was in charge and I was making the decisions and I just made, you know, I just sort of pursued my life from that place of self-confidence. So I certainly encourage everyone to believe in your gifts and talents and to believe in yourself and to be willing to take risks and be on the leading edge of what you don't know yet, right? Because mm -hmm. that's always going to continue to teach and grow and, and bring you new gifts and talents. So yes, I, that, I was coming from that place of uh, I guess self-confidence is a good word, right? Knowing who I was and knowing that mm -hmm. I could 
I could do something and also wanting it. And now that's very, very important. A lot of times people do get offered great opportunity, but they don't necessarily know if they want it, right? Mm -hmm. They hold back from that breakthrough moment because they're not sure. Uh, but I felt a great deal of surety. Mm, that's awesome. So, so you go on, you get this opportunity for this big experience in Los Angeles. And how, I know we're probably moving across multiple span of yeah. years. <laughs> we are, right? Yes. But I, I wanted to ask you about um, your work with Agape and with Michael Beckwith and how that opportunity arose for you I mean, it's related, but it does seem like a big shift to go from, you know, being in the music world in making music in sort of this high end way and then shifting to working in transformational media. How did you get involved with Agape? First, as a just as a congregate, a friend of mine said to me, and again, it's the music that led me there. Mm -hmm. So if you know Agape, uh, a big, big part of the appeal of Agape is the music of the sound of agape, they call it. It's the music of agape. Ricky Byers, who was the choir director, Michael Beckwith, who wrote a lot of the, the, the lyrics, uh, and beautiful agape international choir. And it was just so much music associated with it. This friend said to me, I don't know if you're going to like the message. I can't tell you, I do, he said, but you're gonna love the music. So I went, okay, I'll go, right? Now, this was a time where I had been 15 years amongst the unchurched, right? Someone who was raised a Catholic and then moved away from any of the spirituality or any of the wisdom traditions, any of the religions, because I really didn't feel comfortable doing it. And I literally went through a long period of being angry, I thought, at, you know, at the circumstances of my life. Well, how did this happen? Not, not the good things, but the death of my sister, and then the subsequent death 10 years later of my older sister in a plane crash. So, you got to move forward from 1969 when my sister Charlotte was killed to 1979. Ten years later, I thought I had put my life back together. I was on track. And all of a sudden, my older sister, who was just the most incredible person in my life, my biggest supporter, died in a plane crash. And I went, you know, how is this possible? Uh, I thought I learned that lesson. I thought I overcame that challenge. Now you're giving it to me all over again. And, I, and I, I don't know if I have the strength to manage it. And I went through several years of being very unhappy. It was the lowest point in my life. I, I responded less well to Ellen's death than I did to Charlotte's death. I just didn't think I could handle it again, right? Um, so I went through a, a decade of being um, mad at God, you know? Like, how could you... You know, I understand this is what I'm supposed to be dealing with, but I don't understand why. Why so much, right? Um, and I felt it was unfair somehow. So along comes Agape, and my friend said, you might really find something special in this. So I go to Agape with him, loved the music. Didn't immediately get Michael Beckwith, uh, but I, I just loved the experience. And um, so I started going back. And then I started hearing his message, which is about uh, self-determination, self-responsibility, um, self-awareness, uh, and so many other positive qualities that help you to deal with the stresses, the tragedies, and the challenges in your life. And it really helped me so, so much. So Michael Beckworth became my teacher, my mentor, you know, my minister. Uh, as a as a congregant at Agape, and because the music was such a big part of the of the whole community and still is, um, eventually I was invited to join the music ministry, which was the musicians and the you know people who were there uh, because I knew somebody who knew somebody, and they said you know we should invite this guy, so I did, and then through that I actually met Michael Beckwith personally rather than sitting in the uh, in the church and watching him, right? He met me. And within a couple years, he invited me to come to Agape. He said, Stephen, I see you in my dreams. We're meant to work together. This is, he said, this is a very clear vision for me that we are meant to work together to use your skills and talents in media and entertainment 
and my skills in terms of my awareness and my teachings and, and use media to create good, to, to promote good. And I thought, wow, that's really appealing to me. Yeah. And so I left a very high paying job as the president of a consumer electronics company. And I took an 80% pay cut uh, because I thought I was financially stable at that point in my life uh, and I could do it. And I went to work at a nonprofit spiritual center uh, working with Michael Beckwith uh, to create uh, you know, a media company called Agape Media International. And then that experience of working daily with Michael, him being a mentor to me, him being a friend to me, he's the godfather of you know, uh, my son and so forth. It was, I just started to learn. This is what I needed to know. Mm. You know, this has been a gift for me. Uh, and now I'm really starting to meet all of these other major voices in, in transformational uh, teachings and, and so forth, but not religious, spiritual, but not religious. And that I loved. And so that's really how that transition occurred. And then once I had been CEO of Agape Media for six years, then all of a sudden I became, oh, he is the spiritual producer of Los Angeles. You know, he's the guy, right? So then more started coming my way. Wow. You know, it occurs to me in listening to your story so far, just how important community, right? You had your community at Charlotte's Web of these artists and one thing led to another. And then this community, you said, you know, you became the community member first yes. before evolving into a leader within that community. And, yes. you know, our foundation is definitely all about community, all about intergenerational mentoring. I think sometimes people get anxious about the idea of networking, you yes. know? And what is authentic networking versus yes. networking for the sake of networking? Yes, very much so. So first off, you're, you're exactly right. And in the first interview I did in 1972 with the Rockford Papers, as we were opening Charlotte's Web, I was quoted as saying, we are building a musical community in Rockford. Mm. And that was in the headline, right? Uh, and so I've always recognized now why community is powerful because we're so much more you know, we have a smaller community, our family, our friends, but larger community. Um, the concept of a mastermind, right? That, that a group of us can have a better vision for what to do than just one of us individually. Uh, you know, as long as you also hold on to your own, what you know, right? Don't, don't suddenly just give up yourself in the community. You gotta stay strong in what you know and offer that to the community. So the advice I would give about community is when people are like networking, what's wrong with that? They're looking for something. They're coming you know, with need. Oh, I'm trying to meet a person who's going to help me move up the ladder. Instead, reverse that and say, how can I give? How can I serve? What can I offer to this community? And then it will flow back to you. So the idea of community is to give and to serve. Wow, that's such a that's such a special word of advice and just lovely. And we can see how that really worked out for you and how it brought all of, like you said, you were giving and it came back your way as well. Yes. Um, and I know there were a lot of um, other amazing ventures along the way, but I'm going to jump now to present day. And two things I wanted to talk to you about that you're working on, but let's talk about Wisdom LA. This sounds really fascinating. This is an immersive VR dome theater, but I know it's so much more. So I'd love to hear you explain it because I know that it's pretty tremendous. Well, thank you. Yes. And it is um, so immersive media, meaning a 360 degree camera, uh, surround sound, um, augmented reality, uh, holographic imagery all puts the viewer instead of having a separation between the performer and the viewer now you are within the scene and so your brain literally interprets the experience differently and there's been a lot of wonderful research about the neural pathways uh, that are built by immersive media your brain can't tell the difference between this is quote unquote real, you know, me looking out on the earth and me looking at a seamless high resolution image that puts me in the Bahamas, right? So I'm in a dome in LA, but 
my brain can't tell that I'm not, you know, on the moon or in the Bahamas or wherever it is. It literally, a lot of research shows that. So it's a powerful medium for teaching. It's a powerful medium for transformation because your receptivity to the information that's being shared is so much greater on a scientific neurological level. Wow. So, um, so that knowing that, and it's a very exciting medium that combines audio, visual, community. The, the idea of wisdom is that it's virtual reality, which people do in, head, in head, headsets, right. but without the headset, so that it can be a social ex, uh, ex, uh, experience. So that I can go with my wife and say, did you see that, honey? Wasn't that amazing? Rather than I'm in a headset going, well, that's kind of amazing, but I feel all alone yeah. in here, right? Uh, so the real core concept of wisdom is to offer immersive media in a social environment so that we still have that human connection that's so important. And the root word of wisdom is wisdom. So myself and my partners are still trying to use this medium of immersive music and art as a way to uplift the human spirit, as a way to teach, as a way to share. Uh, and, and that's what wisdom is. So we do all kinds of shows. Uh, the URL is, is wisdom.la, so www.wisdom, W-I-S-D-O-M-E dot L-A. Uh, and we're closed for COVID right now, but we will be reopening this summer, uh, August 1st, and uh, we'll be you know, offering many more wonderful uh, immersive shows. And we do all kinds of shows ranging from sound healings, which are amazing in a geodesic dome uh, because of the resonance, um, to classic rock, like a, the Pink Floyd immersive show that we do, or the Jimi Hendrix immersive show that we do, or the Grateful Dead immersive show that we do. But then we also do contemporary music. So Diplo has performed there, and Marshmallow was developing a, an EDM show based on immersion. Um, Katy Perry has come down a lot. Demi Lovato was a fan of, uh, of Wisdom. Uh, artists are seeing the potential of this new medium for spectacular entertainment, but also impactful transformational uh, media. And so that's what, that's what Wisdom is all about. Wow, that's so incredible. That is so incredible. And it's really cool to see how still that theme of community, that this is a social gathering that people can experience together and that that has been a strong theme for you and throughout everything that you've and, done. And for those, who, for those, thank you. And for those who, for example, are a part of the Burning Man community, you know, the burners, yeah. that's, a, that's a tremendous underlying theme, right? In that case, they call it tribe, right? But tribe right. is community, right? Uh, and your vibe attracts your tribe, right? So where did, where did wisdom begin? with the Burning Man community. And I know that you said as well that it has um, the mental health capacities, that there's a lot of healing that can be done with this. And you're also, so you're working in that way for mental health and you're also working on a film right now, which I wanna discuss as well, that speaks to mental health. So your present project, you're producer of a new full length feature film, We Are Never Alone, starring the renowned French actress, Gabriella Wright, as a mother whose teenage son commits suicide. And Deepak Chopra himself, he plays himself, is a wellness advocate who counsels her in recovery. Yes. Um, how did you get involved Deepak in that Chopra? project? Well, um, again, community, right? So uh, following my years at Agape, I became the CEO of B the Bodhi Tree, which is the uh, first metaphysical bookstore, uh, as far as we know, in the United States, opened in 1970 and brought all this, you know, wonderful uh, books. Uh, and music, uh, you know, talking about this, this new field of spirituality and self-awareness, you know, to the world. Uh, and we, we launched Bodhi Tree as, a, um, as an online brand uh, for the modern world, because in today's day and age, a, a little bookstore on Melrose Avenue can't compete with Amazon on pricing. So, so during the amazing place to just go sit and... Totally, yeah, oh, totally. So and so, cool. so historically important for the way that it built community, right? So I, I loved doing that job. During that time, I was promoting, we opened a little storefront where we had live events. 
Um, I just can't get away from that, right? So <laughs> we, would, we would bring in, we'd do book book authors, you know, do their book launches and they'd talk. We do musicians and, and they'd sing and do meditation classes and do all kinds of things like that. One of the meditation teachers and singers was a gentleman named Michel Pascal, who's a French actor, I'm sorry, French director, uh, author, singer. Um, and I love Michel and, and we connected and he started, and then, then I promoted an event with Deepak Chopra for the Bodhi tree. And Deepak Chopra came up at this event and said, well, the first time I spoke at the Bodhi tree was in 1974 or whatever the year was. He said, and I had about seven people in the audience. Uh, and he said, so I am forever indebted to the Bodhi tree for, you know, being probably the most important launching place of my career. And I love the Bodhi tree. Wonderful. So I'm, I introduced Michelle to, to Deepak that night because he was the opening act. Michelle was the opening act for Deepak. And that friendship grew into this film. So Michelle had the idea for the film and Gabriella. And because I had introduced them to Deepak, they went to him to talk about, would you be a part of this? And it, and it sort of all came together. So that's, you know, I was just part of it and in the right place at the right time, making some important introductions. Um, but yeah, we're, it's, a, it's a film that uh, is going to be released in the coming year. Uh, as you mentioned, it is about, it's about suicide recovery for those who are left behind. How do I go on with my life? This is what Gabriella as the mother is, uh, is really examining. And she goes to see various wisdom teachers, including Deepak Chopra and also Michael Beckwith and also uh, Temple Hayes, Reverend Dr. Temple Hayes, who's the head of a Unity Church in, in Florida and uh, Dr. Gary Schwartz. And uh, so it gives a context for her to receive the advice and wisdom of these, of these teachers. Um, and, and that's the nature of the film. And she, it's a journey of understanding the metaphysical and the physical. So one of the things when you get really deep into this, and Deepak says this in the film, is that all that we perceive that we call real is really the output of our consciousness. It's a very deep thing to start thinking about, right? You know, but we know that there are so many levels and layers to energy. Now that we can really look at you know, and again, back to my molecular biology, you can look at, at physical atoms at the micro level, you begin to understand that, you know, everything is made up of these molecular structures and it's all moving and what we think of as a rock has um, life, you know, and has its own form. I mean, that's one of the things shamans were saying for 3000 years, the rocks have life, the trees have life, the earth has life. And it makes sense when you realize that it's all composed of the same molecular material, right? Uh, that you begin to do that. So then you take that and you say, oh, so all that I perceive is what's real. And now as a mother, I can perceive my son and I can have a continued relationship with my son, even though he is no longer in physical form. So that's the, that is the, if you will, the heroic, a saving for her, you know, that's where she finds her, uh, her ability to go on. And she understands wow. that she can be connected with him, maybe even more so than she was in real life, where her life was very full of, uh, you know, busy, we have busy lives. And she, she's trying to examine, was I, was I too busy? Was I not a good mom? You know, did I not pay enough attention to you? Uh, really asked a lot of important questions. So, you know, look for the films called We Are Never Alone. We're looking to put it on a platform like Netflix or Amazon Prime and, uh, and to do community screenings and just try to get it out into the world as much well, as we can. Well, that is so powerful. I got chills just hearing that, that small piece of it. I shared with you, you know, I have had a family pass from, from suicide and um, to know that a resource like this is coming is just absolutely um, powerful, important. We know that suicide rates have gone up under the pressure of this pandemic. Yes. And, you know, I work with police officers, suicide rates are up from the trauma that they- Firemen, are, are, it's up, yep. Absolutely, and, and one of the interesting things I know in a conversation we've had prior that has just really stuck with me is this idea of 
because I'm sure some of part of what this film will be dealing with is there's a lot of stigma that people have to deal with in the aftermath of suicide and a lot of misunderstanding, um, partially because we have a lack of conversation around death in our culture, yes. a lack of conversation then, especially around suicide and, and even the phrase, she committed suicide. Can you speak a little bit about that phrase? Because you, you spoke to me on that and it blew my mind. Yes, in, in the course of this work that I've been doing, I've been getting in touch with other counselors and experts and organizations that have been working in this field for a long time, right? I'm totally a newcomer uh, to this and, and learning. Uh, but one of the things that I was counseled was the term committed suicide sort of uh, predisposes a choice. It, it sort of puts a responsibility on the individual. And a lot of what we need to understand is that an individual who is contemplating this, who is in deep depression, is in, you know, they're in trauma themselves. They're not thinking clearly. They're not, uh, under, they're not making a rational choice. So, you know, when you say co committed suicide, it's like, yeah, that's what they chose. And you can be kind of upset with them that they chose it. But when you really understand in what, tr what turmoil they were in, what despair, it's not a choice. Just like it's very, you, you never make decisions or hopefully you try to never make decisions when you're angry, when you're in whatever the lowest emotions are that you may be feeling, grief, anger, upsetness. We've all had that experience. You say something or do something when you're in one of the lower emotions of anger and then you so regret it afterwards. The problem with suicide, you can't change it. You've made this choice and now, or you, this has happened and now there's no... There's no going back. So you want to address, you know, don't make a decision. And this Michael Beckwith talks about this in the film. He mm -hmm. talks about decisions, decision making uh, from different tiers of emotionality. I won't, I won't, I won't cop his uh, his, his uh, advice, but it's it's very good. Well, I cannot wait for this film to come out, and I know that we would be very eager to share it in a community screening as well. Um, and to share it with our community when it when it comes out as a yeah reason. thank you and and you are so right that people don't want to talk about it right so another film that I was involved with in my years at, at Agape was The Secret right oh, yeah. So, yeah so Michael Beckwith was in The Secret he was one of the you know really impact uh, teachers in The Secret and uh, I worked on the marketing of it and very involved with with The Secret during the time that it came out. Now, everybody wanted to know about The Secret and everybody wanted to watch The Secret because it was the law of attraction because many people saw it as, oh, this is what I need to know to get rich. This is what I need to know to be successful, right? So it was about prosperity, which is a very popular topic. Now we're dealing with a topic nobody wants to talk about, nobody wants to know about. As you said, there is a stigma that if you talk about a family member or a friend uh, who died by suicide, uh, why? What was wrong with your family? What was wrong with you? Why, why didn't you help them? You know, uh, you know, all those kinds of things. So people tend to not share about that. And I've been learning as I've been, as I've been working on this film, how many people have said to me, I was touched by suicide. My friend, my, in my, in my own particular case, my niece, many, many, many years ago, right? Uh, and I've never really rarely talk about that. My niece, Josie. Um, and Here's a, just another piece of information uh, that is stark and stunning, which is that the, the French actress you mentioned, Gabriella Wright, in the middle of making this film, her younger sister in her late 20s died of suicide. So they had, we had to interrupt the making of the film for six months. Gabriella had no relationship to that, not, had not occurred in her family. She was doing this from some kind of place in her heart of giving and, and helping. And then all of a sudden it's her closest relationship, her younger sister. Uh, is, so it became, went from fiction to, to real. Mm -hmm. But just so people know, it's her, her, her son is alive and well. Gabrielle has, has a teenage son. So it's not a direct fictional story. But the fact that that happened I'm still trying to understand yes. what that meant. I mean, I'm so fascinated as well by the, by the idea that this is, it's gonna be such a powerful, positive tool 
how yeah. can we that you mentioned I didn't even think oh recovery from the aftermath of that you know as well that those of us who are left behind when suicide happens yes yes and what you said is so true that the people who are affected by someone close to them dying of suicide those are the additional lives that can be lost literally a mother can say I just can't go on living like this. Um, or, and either they may, they may not kill themselves, but they might just give up on life, right? So in effect, their life is over because they just can no longer rediscover a purpose in life, a joy in life, a, any way of being. Anytime you're faced with a major tragedy, you have that choice point, right? That was a choice point that I had. Uh, is like, am I now going to carry around, I'm a sad sack and I'm really, oh, whoa, whoa, this happened to me? Or I'm going to take this and, and, and take the energy of it and do something, you know, positive with it. Uh, and that's, that's the opportunity that you have. So yeah, there's the, there's the people, the recovery, the understanding is so, so important. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. I don't want to, I could keep you all day with all of this wisdom that you have, but you offered so much to our Sage Advice community. And we're just, again, very grateful that you did this interview with us. It's my joy. 